nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Okay, welcome back. I am Tim Fisher from the Mechanical Engineering Department here at Purdue. And today I'm going to talk to you about heat transfer. It'll be the first in a sequence of lectures. Uh, I will give the basic intro, um, talk generally about the uh, energy carriers, heat, thermal energy carriers, carriers, and especially lattice vibrations and phonons. And then the subsequent lectures will be given by Professor Umesh Wagmari from Jawaharlal Nehru Center uh, in India. And he will talk much more about computations and multidimensionality and so forth. So what I want to do today mostly is to give you a flavor of the language of heat transfer, uh, starting from atomistic principles and working our way up, and then uh, do a little bit of, of studies of interfaces because when materials become very, very small, Almost always, the interfaces dominate the transport of heat, um, and in many cases, electrons, uh, charge trans transfer light as well. So that's what we'll, we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, here's the outline <coughs> of the talk. I'll give uh, just a few slides of so may, what may be a motivating introduction on applications. I'm an engineer after all, so I think about applications quite a bit. Uh, but then we'll go through with more of a definitions um, we will talk about continuum principles quite a bit and go back and forth. Um, it, it helps me personally uh, to understand and explain lattice vibrations by thinking about the continuum analogs, and we'll do that along the way using uh, a continuous string as an example. Uh, then we'll get through, uh, again, talk about some interfaces uh, and get back to our discrete problem of uh, discrete masses or lattices of atoms. And then lastly, I'll wrap up with just a few final thoughts about larger scales that will be a springboard into tomorrow's lecture. So <clears throat> generally, heat transfer is, is one form of energy transfer. And I, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that energy is a big deal, especially today, much more so even than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Um, but some of the, the applications that are especially uh, relevant uh, in in this heat and maybe mass transfer. If you look at the third the third example, are photovoltaics, and you say, well, there's heat transfer is not a direct um, contributor to photovoltaic uh, energy conversion. However, it's a unwanted byproduct, and so it actually decreases the efficiency of photovoltaics. And so thermal considerations are often very important in photovoltaics. And then, of course, there are many other kinds of energy conversion processes involving solar energy input uh, that, that goes to heat. In fact, there's about 10 times more intentional solar to thermal energy conversion, so engineered solar to thermal energy conversion deployed around the world today than there is solar to electrical direct. So there's 10 times more, basically, heating water uh, happening around the world than there is uh, heating water intentionally uh, in an engineered system, then there is uh, photovoltaic deployment around the world today. That will shift in the coming years as photovoltaic technology uh, continues to grow and become more economical, but still, just putting something black on a tank of water is pretty effective. You can actually capture almost all of the incident sunlight and and store it in the, in the water, so it's, it's quite effective. Uh, the second is thermoelectrics. Thermoelectrics, uh, generally speaking, is uh, a topic that is amazingly alluring, I think, uh, to many people because it's so simple, there's no moving parts. It, kind of, it can be thought of as a, a heat engine, a Carnot heat engine, except instead of having some kind of working fluid, the electrons are your working fluid, and so you compress them and you expand them, and it's all done in a in a way that, that we can't even see, uh, at least with our naked eye, and so they can be very reliable. The problem is that 
there's too much heat transfer going on in these processes, and so it's very difficult to make them efficient. The last part of this is a, a, a fuel cell application, proton exchange in, the, in this case, where heat transfer is also very important, as is mass transfer um, in, these, in keeping th these things working, um, keeping flooding of water from happening, and then dry out, and all kinds of other processes. So <clears throat> other applications of heat transfer, this is one that's I think probably fairly uh, well known to this audience, and that is uh, heating or self-heating of uh, nano or microelectronic devices. That is the, the, the heating of structures such as this one where you have a transistor and you have a, a buried oxide that is a generally thermally insulating. Uh, and other, other parts of this cross-section that are also insulating, that has caused so many problems in practice that we really don't see clock speeds of, of microprocessors increasing anymore. It's very much plateaued, and now they're going to architectural changes that will enhance computational speed of a single device, uh, or I should say of a single component. Uh, laser manufacturing is another where obviously heat transfer is important if you're going to melt or ablate a material. All right, so that's it for the motivation. Other than to say, if you take all of these different um, types of energy conversion processes uh, and you, you, you map them from their source and then into their utilization, and this is a bit dated, but if we look at this 56% uh, of energy is lost, and almost all of that is lost to heat, to waste heat. Now there has to be waste heat in many of the energy conversion processes that we use because of the second law of thermodynamics, which I won't go into today, but th there's basically a, a law that says you can't take randomized forms of, of energy, meaning thermalized forms of energy, and convert all of that into some kind of directed form of energy. There's the randomness of that initial state of energy uh, is cannot be harnessed completely. So uh, there has to be some, some energy loss. But there's far more than, than the upper limit, the upper the theoretical limit um, says we, we could have, possibly. And most of that is, is uh, lost as thermal waste. So this thermal energy is typically carried by, uh, by three kinds of particles, or four if you, if you want to count uh, uh, photons as well. But phonons are quanta of lattice vibration, so these are things that move through solids, um, and we'll talk mostly about those today. There are a couple of different types, and we'll go through those as we, as we proceed through the lecture. Electrons, charged particles that also carry heat. In fact, in metals, the, uh, the electrons are typically the dominant thermal energy carriers. Therefore, when I, talk, when I teach mechanical engineering students, I, I encourage them not to think that electrons are for the domain of only the electrical engineers because the electrons carry the heat. So we at least have a little part of their... Uh, we have some responsibility for, for handling... Uh, their engineering as well. Uh, fluid particles are, you could think of these as single atoms or molecules or small clumps of those uh, together. And so fluids carry energy um, as well. And they can conduct heat, meaning that if the fluid is stagnant, heat still flows through that medium, and that's called heat conduction. Or the fluid can be moving, and that's called heat convection. And then lastly, the photons um, are uh, responsible, photons are responsible for thermal radiation. And we won't talk explicitly about uh, thermal radiation except for a little bit in, uh, somewhat later in the lecture where we draw an analog between the photon and the phonon because their governing statistical mechanics are the same. So what about, what's interesting about nanoscale objects, devices, features, carriers, uh, in the context of energy. Well, if we look at this, we have, I usually think of this in terms of uh, the, the relevant length scales, and there are two main ones. Uh, one of those is the mean free path, so that's how far on average a carrier will travel before it collides with something else. Uh, and, and then also the wavelength of that carrier. We can give a wave, wavelength to uh, 
uh, any type of carrier. And if we look at these different kinds of, of carriers here, you have photons with uh, fairly small uh, mean free paths in, in most media. Of course, they're very long in others, uh, in free space, for example. Uh, and then fairly large, or can have fairly large wavelengths, or long wavelengths. Phonons, on the other hand, have shorter wavelengths, generally, about one nanometer. Uh, electrons have uh, a little bit of kind of in the middle here on, on mean free path and so forth, and then molecules. So they, these are all very well into whatever nanoscale regime you want to call. There's also some, you know, occasionally some debate or a discussion at least about about what nano is, but all of these are, I think, well inside of the nano regime. And so we have to somehow come up with a way to model uh, the carriers in a way that, as a, from an engineer's perspective, we get useful answers out at the other end while retaining as much of the relevant physics at these length scales as we can, as we need, really. Um, and that's kind of the subject of what we'll, we'll do today. Uh, this slide is an eye chart um, to test your, your eyesight, uh, but it's, it's really in there for your, your notes. You can, uh, you, you can refer back to it. I, I enjoy having these kinds of summary charts in, in a collection of notes. Uh, I enjoy it when I'm learning, and so you can, you can go through. Yes? Are electrons effective in carrying heat? Because electrons very close to the Fermi level, you need to take and participate in transferring heat, right? Correct. Yes. They, it, they're a small fraction in semiconductors. So in semiconductors, even highly doped semiconductors, their, their occupation number is not large enough. But in metals, they are. The, the occupation number is high enough at and around the Fermi level within KBT or KT of the Fermi level to, to be significant. And unfortunately, in my lecture, I won't be able to go through that. I won't have time to do that, but I can, I would be more than happy to explain the reasons why it's a fairly simple explanation. Yeah. Good. So this is for you and your notes. Um, the, I probably the thing I'll draw out here is that the, the statistical distribution functions for these carriers are listed and, um, and you can see here that phonons are very similar to photons basically the same. Um, electrons are Fermi-Dirac statistics, so photons and, and phonons are bosons, and then fluid particles uh, follow Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, which is a good approximation in some cases to electrons and phonons. Now we'll move into lattice vibrations, but today, at least on the theoretical side, we're going to restrict ourselves to one dimension, so just a chain of atoms. And I, there are plenty of complications that arise from multi-dimensions, but I think if you get this, those extensions will be fairly straightforward and Professor Wagmari will uh, apply those in the coming lectures. So if we, we first look at two atoms together. Let's say that they share a chemical bond, so this would be like a diatomic uh, molecule. And we say that that bond, it's not rigid, we're going to treat it like a spring, it's not a perfect spring, but at least toward the bottom of the well it is. So I hope that this is not too uh, basic for you who've probably seen this many times. We'll get, we'll get far enough into this soon that uh, maybe we'll recapture your attention. But the equilibrium separation of these atoms we'll denote by R0. Okay? And just think about the shape of this, um, of this uh, potential function that governs that, uh, that bond. These lattice vibrations would arise from the stretching and contraction of that bond, and near the minimum of the uh, of, of the potential function, it looks like a parabolic uh, relationship. And so, for our purposes today, we will assume that it is, and we'll call the displacement here lowercase u. So, and uh, I apologize in advance that sometimes we're going to have to use the same letters of the alphabet for different things. Um, here, capital U is the potential function, lowercase u is the separation. That's the separation away from that equilibrium position, R0. Uh, G, in this case, is a spring constant, which is going to be the subject of quite a bit of work uh, that we get into in the coming lectures. 
Uh, but for now, you can think of this as a perfect linear uh, spring, and we will make some deviations from that later. Now, that what we just talked about was just a diatomic molecule, but in a solid material, it has a much larger extent. So now we're going to expand that to a long chain of atoms, but still only in one dimension. One dimension in terms of their arrangement for now and also in terms of their allowed displacement. You could imagine a chain that you could give three degrees of freedom of displacement to, but we're going to keep it simple for now and say we're only going to allow one degree of freedom of motion. So we apply this spring relationship to every one of those atoms in this array or in this chain and this, this uh, approximation that we've made, we've assumed that each of these springs is what's called harmonic. You probably are familiar with that. This is our harmonic potential then. And so we're going to add up all of these displacements away from equilibrium, apply those to the amount that, the, that this, each spring is stretched or contracted or compressed, and we're going to add up all of those resultant energies and say that that's our harmonic potential function. So if we have this harmonic potential function, we can use that because we should know, we should have that the derivative of that energy with respect to displacement should give us a force because force times distance or displacement is energy, right? And so we'll use that, but before we'll say, we'll, we'll start with Newton's second law, F equals MA. That's what the, the first equality tells. The second one is that replacement of the force with this derivative of the potential with respect to displacement. And then we come back up top here, and you have to follow the notation a little bit. You have to think about this chain. Uh, I'm differentiating with respect to the displacement at a given lattice site, n times a. All right, so if I apply this derivative to this summation, that location, let's say that n is five, that location, 5a, is going to show up in three of these terms, okay? And so you can, you can actually expand this out. I encourage you to do that on your own. And you'll find that the force on, atom at, on the atom at na, at location na, is simply the sum of, uh, of three displacements, okay? That's its own displacement and its two nearest neighbors multiplied by that spring constant, okay? Very simple. This is a very important equation, however, because it now gives us an equation of motion for that, right? Because I was able to take this, this is F to, uh, m times mass times acceleration, because I have that term, that gives me a, a time derivative. I put this in, I simplify the notation, uh, and we have a, an expression that we can solve, a, an easy differential equation to solve. So we will, start to solve it, but we need a couple of things. Of course, if it's a differential equation, we need some boundary conditions, for one. And we will make a simple assumption uh, to begin with, and that is that uh, the, the form of the solutions for displacement at any position n in this chain uh, will be uh, a plane wave type of form. So it will have this exponential type of form where we'll start to explain some of these terms here, this capital K, omega, and so forth. But before we get there, just kind of trust the math for now, if you would. We will, for boundary conditions, we will um, assume that this chain, for now, is connected at its end. That, that will be our boundary condition. So we will have a periodic boundary condition. Um, and that's how we'll handle that. And then these equalities simply say that atom zero and atom one uh, are the same as atom, uh, the displacements there are the same as those at, at location capital N, that's the total number of atoms in our chain, and N plus one. So if we do this and apply, apply those boundary conditions with the plane wave approximation that we have, we will find that we can reduce this quite easily, and the only way that our boundary conditions would be satisfied is if these terms, K times the total number of atoms times A, which is my separation distance between two atoms, that's my lattice constant, 
is equal to 2 pi times n, n being an integer. Um, and this is the only possible solution where my boundary conditions are satisfied. And what this really tells us is that there are only that many modes of vibration allowed. Uh, and so the, we were, we're going to call this, um, this k, we'll call that the wave vector. We solve this required equality required from the boundary conditions. So the wave vector k will now be discrete because it's marching through integer lowercase n, and it is dictated by the total number of atoms n. So I heard a question on the side yesterday in, in um, a student was asking Professor Datta about this. Uh, why, do, why are phonons quantized? Why do they have a, a, a k vector that is discrete? Uh, and the reason is that you have a discrete number of points n, but of course, uh, capital N, or discrete number of, of atoms. And as that number grows, it becomes ostensibly less and less discrete, right? If I have many, many atoms, uh, then this will still be discrete, but we can always, almost always treat it as a continuum. Yeah? I would say the same for electrons. Yeah. yeah. The discreteness of K should be similar in both. Absolutely. Yep. The number of bands will depend on how many electrons you have. Right, right. The other thing to note here, this will come back again later, is that the minimum wavelength, there is, there is a minimum wavelength for phonons, and that minimum is going to be two times my lattice spacing A. And this, this becomes crucially important because of some of the statistics involved um, and the way that these bands, these phonon bands then uh, are shaped uh, and, and, and their periodicity. This uh, two way you can, I think, rationalize that I, I could not have a, I, my lattice could not support a wavelength that was, say, a one lattice spacing because if I had something like that, let's say it was a standing wave, uh, there would be no node in the middle. There's no atom there. It's just free space and that is, is not something that my basis, which is my lattice, could support. So <clears throat> we go back to some of the math, and we won't do too much math hereafter, but we <clears throat> excuse me, continue on this and uh, plug in our, uh, our assumed solution uh, and the now the required wave vectors that we have from the boundary conditions into our equation of motion. And the purpose in this is to find a relationship between the frequencies and the wavelengths or wave vectors. Because once we know that relationship, we can do a lot of things with it that I'll, that I'll talk about in a moment. So we solve for this frequency or these families of frequencies. Remember, omega now depends on k, the wave vector, which is itself discrete, which makes omega discrete, so omega is like a, an eigenvalue for this problem. And with a little bit of trigonometric uh, fiddling around, you can, you can turn this into this expression into a sine curve. So the frequency depends on the wave vector in a sinusoidal way. Other relevant things are that the frequency is proportional to the square root of the spring constant, we're going to talk a lot about spring constants. We might not call them that, but we'll talk a lot about spring constants and how to derive those from first principles in, in subsequent lectures. And, and this should make some intuitive sense to you. If the spring is stiffer, G is higher, then my frequency will be higher. That should make sense. Likewise, it's inversely proportional to the square root of mass so that if my mass is smaller, I would expect to have to be able to have higher frequency vibrations. A heavy thing will be harder to move quickly. All right, so hopefully it meets your intuition. And this is called the dispersion relation, and this is for acoustic phonons that have this characteristic sinusoidal type of shape, okay? I hope that this is not too, uh, too new to, to any of you. I suspect it's not. So. If you go back and, and change the wave vector by an integer value of uh, an integer of two pi over a, a being the lattice constant, then the displacement will be unaffected. So only uh, 
only a range of 2 pi over a in k space is unique, and therefore uh, we can, we can ab abbreviate the, the uh, k space. Uh, in this way, and typically this is the way it's done. We choose the origin, k equals zero, and we go out to pi over a and minus pi over a. And we get signs on both sides. Uh, this is called the first Brillouin zone. I think that's probably fairly well established or well known to this audience. Uh, some other relevant factors here are, uh, we have a phase velocity, which is the ratio of frequency to wave vector. But more importantly, we have this thing called the group velocity, uh, which is has more to do with the, the crystal momentum. You could imagine if k is periodic, then this phase velocity, as I get away from the first Brillouin zone, um, would, would be not so meaningful, because k is just going on and on kind of in a sinusoidal uh, repetitive way. The group velocity, on the other hand, is the, the, um, the velocity with which energy moves it's called the, it's part of the, what's called the crystal momentum uh, in, a, in a lattice. And it is the derivative of frequency with respect to wave vector. I've gone ahead and just done that simple uh, derivative on the sine function. And in the limits, when k is very small, and that means we have very long wavelengths. When my wave vector is small, my wavelength is long. The frequency is proportional to the wave vector k. And that's important because in that regime, it, having a linear relationship or a linear dispersion forms the basis of one of the most important approximations, lattice approximations, that ever has been, and that's the Debye approximation. Uh, I won't go through that, but if you've heard that before, that's kind of, this is the, the basis of it, essentially. And then as, um, at, also as k goes to zero, the group velocity matches the phase velocity. Okay. Now, these are all, all of these results are for acoustic phonons. There are optical phonons. Optical phonons are probably generally more interesting to electrical folks working in electrical transport, I would imagine, because they're higher energy. They have uh, a greater cross section of scattering with, with electrons. But, but we're going to stick to the, to the acoustic phonons today. Uh, we'll have a few general results that would apply to both a little bit later. I will say that optical phonons, higher frequency ones, the optical phonons that do not have zero frequency at zero wave vector, they come from having a lattice um, with a basis. So if you have a basis atom along with the primary atom in your lattice, which we don't have here in this one-dimensional lattice, then you, can, you have the, the chance to have optical phonons. As we go to the edge of that first Brillouin zone, the group velocity is zero because the sine wave flattens out. That's the peak of the sine wave. But physically, why is that? Well, it's not very hard to, to describe it. If you, if you take k as being plus or minus pi over a and do the math on that, you'd see the displacement for neighboring atoms n plus 1 and n, if I form the ratio, you can see that they are out of phase by pi, or 180 degrees. That means that they're vibrating exactly against each other, and therefore there's no propagation of their energy. It's stagnant, and so their group velocity is zero. All right, now we're moving on to a continuum case. So we've talked a little bit about, I guess, phonons, or at least lattice vibrations, um, and I wanted to talk a bit about how this relates to some things you might have <coughs> come across maybe in, in undergraduate physics uh, for continuum uh, concepts. So if we have, let's take an ordinary differential equation that looks like this, where the prime symbol denotes differentiation once. Uh, we, we take an ODE of a form that looks like this. Uh, it has boundary conditions that are just given here. These are boundary conditions of the first kind. And we apply it to the displacement, the static displacement of a loaded string. So I have a string that has boundary conditions on displacement. We'll call u the displacement uh, at its two ends. And then we put some load, we'll call it f of x. That's the f of x up top here. 
onto that string and how much does it deform? Well, that is, this is essentially that problem with k, that's the k up here being zero and having uh, fixed displacement, zero displacements, homogeneous boundary conditions as well. So this is actually a very simple problem to solve. I won't solve it exactly here. I'd like to go to the dynamic string where now we have a, a similar kind of problem. This is a, a vibrating string and it has fixed end boundary conditions and this is the uh, the equation, the governing equation, Y is displacement, T is tension, so tension is a lot like that spring constant that we talked about a moment ago. Mu is the mass density of the, of the string, so that's the mass per unit length of that string, so that's a lot like the, uh, the atomic mass that we talked about before. And we're interested in the natural frequencies of this vibration, and so if we're, if we're going to start there with that as a, as a goal to get natural frequencies, the first thing that we'll do is to take, um, is to assume that the solution is separable into a steady and transient component with the transient component being periodic. And we'll go ahead and, and assume that that's a cosine function uh, for, uh, for now. So if we go ahead and, and do that substitution, substitute that cosine function for the time <coughs> dependence into the governing equation, then we can have, we have a new governing equation on mu, the displacement, the static or the steady uh, displacement that is shown here. This is very similar to the, the general equation for the static displaced string that we had before, right? It has the same kinds of terms in it. So again, this is basically solving the same problem uh, for the steady component of this transient or dynamic problem. So the solution of this problem is fairly straightforward. We find that many different wavelengths will satisfy the boundary conditions uh, of this problem. And so if we have many different solutions, then we will have many different frequencies, many different wavelengths, and they all take the form of this uh, sine function, not surprisingly, um, I hope. And uh, here we show, this is from a, a very good textbook on vibration and waves, very old, good textbook. Um, sorry if you can't see it quite that well, but these are different modes, natural modes of vibration of this string between two uh, fixed ends, okay? And the wavelength you can see uh, is, uh, is quantized, I guess you would call it, um, by a factor, two, L being the length between the, the two fixed ends and then we just have an integer running between those. V is a speed, and, and you could say, what speed is this? Just think of it right now as an, an kind of an average uh, speed of the movement of the string back and forth, uh, and that is going to be related to the tension and the mass, just like before when we talked about the dispersion curve for the, for the uh, 1D atomic chain, right, there was a square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. It's the same kind of thing here. So if we translate those wavelengths to frequencies and including the velocity, um, that again depends on the tension and the mass or the uh, mass density, we can express this in a number of different ways. I've kind of listed them all here just in case, depending on what flavor you like the best of sine functions and wavelengths or wave vectors, they're pretty much all here. This wave vector once again comes back, and that's 2 pi divided by the wavelength, which is discrete, takes on discrete values, much in, in much the way that we just saw with our, um, with our uh, atomic chain lattice. So what about waves that, instead of being standing waves, which is what we just showed, what if they're progressing? What happens then? Um, what's the big difference? And I, you may may not be able to see this so well, it's probably better in your printout. Um, but if we start, if we, we'll, we'll go back quickly to this solution, which is a product of sine and cosine. Uh, the sine term contains the wavelength information, uh, the cosine term, and wavelength and, and distance, or position, and cosine term contains the time variation. If we go back, we, we do a simple 
trigonometric identity switch uh, for this problem, <coughs> apply it to our other solution, we actually find that this, uh, these progressing waves, the way if you were standing, if I were standing on a wall, I had a rope attached to the, to the wall over here and I wanted to make a standing wave, what I would do is I would send a, a, a progressing wave out, right, and I would do that until everything kind of started to stand still. And what this solution tells us, and that's what this, this figure kind of shows, is that what that really is, and, and this is a standing wave solution itself, this y uh, is displacement as a function of position and time. That is a standing wave solution. But what it says is the standing wave is just, is simply the superposition of a rightward and a leftward moving wave. And when they, e when they perfectly balance each other out, things will become standing waves. That's, that's really what it's saying. So there's not so much of a difference between standing waves and traveling waves, okay? And why is that relevant here? Well, we want to talk a bit about these traveling waves um, because I, I'm most interested in interfaces. We said before that um, when we're dealing with nanomaterials, the interface uh, ends up being very important and sometimes dominating, often dominating the, the thermal transport characteristics. So we have, we're now going to look at an interface where two strings come together, as shown as in that top right figure. Two strings come together, and they have different um, different mass densities. The one on the left is small, the one on the right is large. They have to be under the same tension in order to balance forces. Um, so we, we take this, and now we have to do a little bit of generalization where the left string has a mass density mu1 and a some characteristic velocity v1. We'll say that it's a constant velocity. The waves travel on it regardless of their wavelength. They travel uh, with a constant velocity, which is typical of acoustic ty types of waves. That means acoustic in the acoustic theory, continuum acoustic theory sense. We will define this pulse. That's what's starting here. So a pulse is coming up started from the left, it has an arbitrary shape, and it hits this interface, and some of it transmits, some of that pulse transmits to the right side, while other, uh, another fraction of it will reflect back. And what I want to do is to, is to start to explain to you how we could quantify how much goes through and how much comes back, okay? And we'll go through a little bit of math, but this math is very generalized. So we're going to define that pulse as a uh, as just a general function that depends only on time minus position over velocity. So that's if you think about this function, it, it depends on that difference, time minus uh, position over velocity. That means that the wave is moving rightward. Okay, so as time goes forward. Position goes forward, and that argument to that f1 stays the same. How do you define velocity? Because we have a decimal string once uh, the pulse is moving. What is velocity? Very good question. So let's say that the string on the left has velocity v1, and it's constant, and the string on the right has velocity v2, and it, and it must be that way. So the velocity, again, depends on only the tension and the mass density as we showed before, the square root of tension over mass density. So each string has the same tension, but the mass densities are different. So that will dictate those velocities. So this, um, a part of this pulse reflects, and we're going to call that function g, which is a function of t time, plus x over v1. Because the reflected part is still in, in domain 1, but it's moving leftward now. Whereas part of this will transmit, part of that incident wave will transmit, we'll call that F2, and it's going to move through the string on the right with the velocity V2. So it has a different velocity. All right, so now <clears throat> if I quantified or if I had a way of, well, I, I do. If we add up these contributions, this pulse goes through, it, some of it reflects back. So the displacement at any position x or time t uh, on the left half in, in domain one uh, 
will be the sum of F1 and G. G was that reflected component. And then in the, on the right side, domain two, the displacement will only be from this F2, this rightward moving wave F2. And we have some boundary conditions so that displacement at the interface, which is x equals zero, uh, of string one and string two have to be the same, and their derivatives have to be the same, their spatial derivatives. If we apply those simple things, we're going to solve for F2, which is that transmitted wave displacement, and G, which is the reflected wave displacement, in terms of F1, and I'm sure that everyone in this room could do it in less than two minutes, so um, I encourage you to do that on the back page of, of your notes. Uh, but if you, if you do that simple calculation, um, applying these boundary conditions, you'll find that the transmitted wave will be, will depend on the velocity ratios, V2 and V1, and it'll be that those velocities will form a prefactor that will just pre-multiply the incident wave F1, and that tells you about the displacement of the transmitted wave. Same kind of, of, a, uh, of a story applies to the reflected wave G, where we have, uh, again, a prefactor that depends on the velocities in the different strings. So one of the things that, the, a couple of things that come out, if, the, if V1 equals V2, it's the same string, right? Because if V1 equals V2, that means that the tension's already the same no matter what, but that means the mass densities are the same. So there's nothing to call it, there is no interface there. And if that's true, you can see here that the G function would be zero. The prefactor would be zero, so the function would be zero for all time. However, if, um, if, V2, or if V2 is zero, which means that it's infinitely massive, then everything is reflected. That's what we would expect, right? So that tells us about the transmission and reflectance of, uh, of displacement. However, we're interested in energy flow, and so we have to do a little bit more work. Um, we really want to know about the rate of energy flow. And you can show, I haven't gone through the, um, any of the derivation here, but, but uh, I would be happy to, to discuss it with you. This rate of energy flow due to these waves depends on the product of mass density, the maximum displacement squared, and the velocity. Okay, so that will give you the rate of energy flow. And so if we now take these waves and apply this, you see that these mass densities would, uh, would cancel. If we want to look at the reflected wave, for example, the mass densities are the same, the velocities are the same, and so really these, the, the energy rate ratio between reflected and incident waves is just going to be the square of the displacement of those two. And so in this case, it would be V2 minus V1 over V2 plus V1, all squared. So you're basically, by going into energy space, you're squaring the, the result. Yeah. This will have to do with group velocity, absolutely. Absolutely. So <clears throat> what most people do, especially in continuum acoustics, is they define an acoustic impedance. We'll call it Z, like everyone else does. We're not special, everyone calls it Z. And you have that, so Z, this acoustic impedance is the ratio of tension, this is the tension of the string, to, it, to the velocity, which we will indeed connect to the group velocity. Uh, and we will define a boundary transmittance. So this is a this is an energy type of transmittance. Now the thing we just did on the previous slide, that was the reflectance, and it's easier because on that side of the, if we only deal with one side of the interface, all the velocities and mass densities are the same, and so we're just going to say that well whatever was not reflected was transmitted. So I'm going to take that that reflectance function and I'm going to just uh, subtract it from one and then we're going to call this the transmission. And we do that and with a little bit of algebra you can see, you can convince yourself that this is just the product of the two impedances multiplied by four uh, divided by the square of their sums, of the sum of the impedances on the two sides. Okay, So this is the acoustic mismatch model and it is used not only for continuum acoustics, but often for 
phonons as well. And the big difference, however, is that for phonons, we already derived, even for that simple one-dimensional chain, we don't have a constant velocity. We have this dispersion that's sinusoidal. So only near the middle of the Brillouin zone is, the, is that linearity uh, approximately true. But as I get away from that, the velocity, um, the velocity changes. That would be the group velocity. And so you have to take this transmission function and really treat it more like a, uh, give it some dependence on wave vector or frequency and then do an integral over this. And that's what, what uh, we, we'll talk about doing as we move forward. This is not too different <coughs> than what people um, need to do for thermal radiation. So if you have <coughs> radi thermal radiation, I hope some of you know at least this would be freshman physics, I think. So what you know, it, it may be in your subconscious by this point in time, but, uh, but it's there somewhere. It should be. Um, thermal radiation energy flux, Q, depends on the fourth power of temperature. You probably remember that. And so if I wanted to describe thermal radiation exchange between two surfaces at temperatures T1 and T2, then the difference of their fourth power of temperature, and it better be an absolute temperature, by the way, common mistake um, from undergraduates. I know you're not mostly undergraduates, but absolute temperature, this difference in the fourth power, multiplied by a prefactor. This is for photons. Um, uh, that's the Ste Stefan Boltzmann constant, right? It was a famous thing, Planck's derivation and all of that. Um, and Nobel Prizes were won. Right when coming up with this constant and these relations. For, for heat conduction, now if I think of this problem as, a, uh, as something similar where I, instead of having photons that are going to the surface, I have lattice waves, right? Phonons, in other words. Uh, then I would, I would need to do something similar where I had some t to the fourth power because those those phonons have the same statistics as the photons. They're both bosons, and so you'll, you might have to trust me on that. That's the, only, um, that's the only justification I'm going to give for it. But what we would need is a new Stefan Boltzmann constant for phonons, and that's given down here. It will depend on the specific heat, so that's how much energy per unit uh, energy uh, a material can take up per degree of temperature rise that comes with it and then normalized by mass or, or volume. Uh, it will also depend on the velocity of the carriers. Okay, so that we already have kind of found that that velocity is going to change for phonons, but whatever it is for the, the frequency of interest, we can, we can plug it in there or we could, as, mo as often as done, we could uh, approximate the velocity is constant. Uh, and then we have this transmission function. So that gets back to what we just talked about. So we know that not all of the energy is going to go through that interface. So some of it will go, will be reflected and some of it will be transmitted. And how that happens will depend to first order on the velocities of the, of the waves in the two medium, in the two media. All right. So then I need to, uh, I will say, well, of course, that's, that's going in one direction from medium one to medium two, but then medium two will also be emitting, thermal radiation is just a, a, a random emission um, phenomenon. So, so there's energy being emitted back through the interface, and so I need now a, a way to describe that kind of trans, transport. And so in this case, I'll need to have another phonon Stefan Boltzmann constant, and another uh, boundary transmission function, but this time it's not quite the same. This one is going from medium two to medium one, and that may be different. So, how do we deal with that? Well, if T1 equals T2, both temp temperature on both sides are the same, then I better have no heat flow, right? If I did have heat flow when the temperatures were the same, in the absence of any other effects, because there, there are a few other things, the electronics that could, electrical interactions that could, could make this happen. But let's say I have nothing else. This is all thermal energy transport only. 
uh, then we have no heat flow. Otherwise, we violate the second law. And so uh, that means that these, the product of these Stefan Boltzmann constants, phonon Stefan Boltzmann constants, and the, the boundary transmission function um, or transmittance tau have to be equal. So that product on each side has to be equal. We then can just substitute our first phonon Stefan Boltzmann constant uh, multiplied by our boundary transmittance from one medium one to medium two, and we have a nice fairly simple equation for this heat flux through the interface, okay? So that, uh, that is the way that one would use this transmittance, this boundary transmittance in a real problem, okay? You would calculate it and you would plug it in here and you could have, you could then uh, derive some kind of heat flux between two surfaces. What I have not done here, admittedly yet, um, is to include kind of the full variation of what happens if, if the velocities do change. I would need to integrate this in, in frequency or K space uh, in order to, because this would be changing and I've assumed it to be constant here. But we'll, we can talk about how that would be affected later um, in, in, a, uh, in different contexts. And I think that uh, that issue will come up in, in the subsequent lectures as well. So now what if I have this problem and we go to discrete masses? So now let's take a real example where I have, um, where I have two atomic chains and they're joined together. So what we did last time, what we did in the, in the last um, atomic chain segment of this lecture was we just had one chain and all the atoms were the same and all the spring constants were the same. And we did some analysis and we found some hopefully useful things about dispersion curves and sine functions. But let's take now two different kinds of chains and how would we analyze such a thing? Well, we'll assume that we know the spring constant between uh, homogeneous atoms, okay, on each side. And of course, we know the mass of the atoms on each side. So I start out by saying, well, if I know this, then at least once I get deep into that, into that part of the chain, because these would go off, let's say, to infinity uh, in each direction, then I'm going to have a dispersion that is, that looks like a sine function. Reasonable? I mean, I, I didn't prove it, but it, it would look very much like that, um, that periodic boundary condition uh, atomic necklace that we did before. Same thing on the right side. I've drawn this in such a way I have lower mass and shorter spacing uh, on, on the right side, which would generally produce a larger Brillouin zone, right? A is smaller so that the, the maximum wave vector is, is larger. Um, and then the mass, is, the, the mass is smaller, so potentially at least, depending on the spring constant, the, uh, the maximum frequency would be higher. The question is, two, two big questions. One is, what is that spring constant where I have at this heterogeneous junction? Uh, this is a big mystery for almost all such problems. I'm not sure that there's, there's even one really good answer. I, of course, people don't study atomic chains, but even when you study epitaxially, uh, heteroepitaxially grown materials in, in, in practice, what is the, what is the spring constant? at that interface. Very, very tough problem. And it may be, it can be crucially important to this. We're going to gloss over that a little bit, but we have a question. Yes, uh, could you please uh, elaborate why uh, the electrons with the positive K values um, uh, is it related to the oh, I'm sorry. positive side in the real space? Yeah, so all I did, they, they would have K vectors in both. I just, I just took the first Brillouin zone and because it's symmetric, for one chain, I just took it on one side, on the side where the chain was. But they would each have their own positive and negative moving waves, possibly. Yeah, yeah. I just did this for convenience. Yeah. yeah uh, in the previous slides, you talked about the wire connected with different densities, and you mentioned that the tension is the same. Yeah. And I, I believe that in atomic scale, before the tension denotes to the force between atoms. Mm -hmm. Do you think that assumption still works? You certainly have to have a force balance, right? You have to have 
equal and opposite action and reaction. So you, you there, there must be a, a force balance in order to have a solid, a stable solid material. Now, that I'm just simply stating the obvious. The question is, how do you, yeah, there are many questions about that. So one is, is it a unique, is there a unique answer for every material combination that you have? Or could there be multiple ways that atoms could configure themselves to produce that stability? Of course, the answer to that question is the second one. There's not only one way. If I have many body problem on one side, many body problem on the other side, and I put them together, there's going to be a number of different possible configurations that would be stable, right? Um, the big question here, and I think that Professor Wagmari will at least start to answer it by the end of tomorrow afternoon, um, is what kind of, uh, it, what, what, do, what needs to be input into a really first principles physics based analysis to figure out what that, what that is? What, what is that spring constant? What is that potential function between those two? It's a very hard problem. So I'm going to cop out and just leave it for Professor Wagmar for tomorrow. But uh, I will say that at least for long waves, you can imagine that for very long waves, they would kind of not so much feel that difference or, you know, that the effects of, of our uncertainty about what that bond is. A long wave will kind of just smooth over that. So let's, let's think about long wavelengths, uh, at least for the, re the rest of my lecture. So we had our earlier dispersion relation, and I'm going to say that we have discrete wave vectors that are allowed. We have, therefore, discrete frequencies that are allowed on each side, right? And so these, again, these, these allowed wave vectors, they march through 2 pi over A, A being the, the lattice constant on either side, and then N is the total number of atoms that I have. Yeah. Do we have a uh, periodicity in this case? We have periodicity here, yes. So that's A. Oh, you mean do we, are we connecting these chains? You could do it either way. You could do it either way. You could solve this problem, but generally a problem like this would be solved, and I have, I'm not going through the whole solution by just letting these things go to infinity. And I'll show you how that's done a, a little bit later. Uh, but we do it with Green's functions. And we don't, we're not sure we have to always do it with Green's functions, but um, but for now, we're doing it with Green's functions. So, we have this. The dispersion is nearly linear, and so the, this it goes with roughly constant velocity. If I differentiate that sine function, right, this dispersion relation, differentiate omega with respect to wave vector, that's going to give me the velocity that was cosine, and at least for very small values of k, that's going to be linear. Um, and this, I, I think that I, I cheated when I wrote this because I say that this is the vibrational eigenspectrum. It's got, I have the, the left side, I have the dispersion relation frequency, and, and on the right side, I have its own dispersion relation, but not really, right? I only have the dispersion relations for these freestanding objects. The, what, is, what is the vibrational eigenspectrum when they're connected? Well, in order for really to know that, one would have to do some things with, especially with that, uh, that interface, that heterogeneous bond between the two. But to first order, this would give us a pretty good idea of the vibrational eigenspectrum, and then we'd have to perturb away from that to get the whole thing. So we have this, uh, if we look at this, a given chain portion or part of the chain I, the velocity, again, is going to be given by this cosine function. We could define an acoustic impedance as the local, the spring constant in that side divided by the velocity at that frequency. So I've now kind of called out that this acoustic impedance would be frequency dependent, and therefore I could produce a boundary transmittance that would be a function of the, uh, that would be a, a function of frequency, and it would depend on the acoustic impedances of each side of the interface at whatever frequency I was dealing with, so at a given frequency. So this would be something that I would then integrate over all frequencies to, uh, to find an overall 
thermal transport or heat flux kind of expression. Okay, I haven't done that, but we will talk a little bit about about that in a in a um, a nano hub tool that we have. So if we go to um, uh, some discussion of thermal properties, larger scale uh, types of problems. If we take this general formalism and we say, well, I want to apply it to a nano something, my first choice for a nano something would be a nano wire or a nano tube. Um, we like to work with those a lot in the laboratory. But I'm going to take this nano wire and I'll say that I'm going to put a temperature reservoir on one side. So I'm going to have fixed temperature on one side, fixed temperature on the other. And then in the middle, I have this green region, and we'll call that the, the device where I'm not controlling what the temperature is. And my question is, um, how much heat would flow between these, these two uh, reservoirs, uh, in the, let's say, in the absence of scattering for now? Um, if we had no scattering, this is a one-dimensional problem. Well, I would say that this heat flux is going to be some integral over wave, wave vector space of so a velocity that is carrying a certain amount of energy relative to a, uh, a chemical, electrochemical, excuse me, a, a chemical potential that for phonons would be zero, but this is more general right now. And then multiplied by some difference in the occupation statistic between one side, from one side to the other. I'd ha I have this factor of two pi here because I'm integrating over K space. And then if I had different bands or polarizations, uh, I would be, uh, I'd have to sum over whatever those were. So I haven't specified what those were, but this is a very general way to formulate a problem. For one dimensional problems, and the reason I like them so much is that um, when we convert from uh, frequency or from K space to frequency space, that group velocity, which we talked about before, is just the derivative of omega with respect to k. Well, if you plug that in, if you look back at the last slide, that velocity was here. Well, now I put it in, but I put it in right here, but it just cancels the k space. Um, uh, it, it cancels dk with dk, and we get a frequency space integral. There's no, in the flux term, there's no longer any velocity, so that's nice. And if I go ahead and, and just extrapolate this out a little bit and carry out the um, analysis, in this case, if we, if we put Bose-Einstein statistics into this expression, which I didn't do before, I kept it generic, but for phonons, they would be governed by Bose-Einstein statistics, we get an expression that looks like this. So this conductance, which would be the ratio of the heat flow to that temperature difference, that small temperature difference that I applied, just like conductance, electrical conductance is the is the rate of charge flow to the potential difference that one had applied in the problem. The thermal conductance, G sub Q, is the rate of heat flow. That's number of joules per second, joules of energy per second, for example. Uh, the ratio of that to whatever temperature difference, which is the driving potential for heat flow that I applied, you go through this and you find that the, uh, that the thermal conductance is quantized in packets or quanta of k squared pi over 6 h bar. So it's not too different than that quantum of electrical uh, uh, conductance. And then, but in this case, we, ha we have a, a, a multiplication factor of temperature. So it increases, this quantum increases with temperature. So this was, um, derived uh, theoretically in 98, but there were other derivations before that. I think they just didn't uh, kind of make so much noise about it. Uh, but then measured in 2000 with a really clever experiment um, where they had a nanostructure with beams that came in and very, very highly uh, calibrated instruments, thermal instruments, tiny ones. Um, to measure this quantum of thermal conductance. I think, in fact, they measured like 16 because they had four legs and four branches. Uh, but this conductance, quantum of conductance, is related to thermal conductivity, which is something that for those of you who don't work in heat transfer um, or, or work in heat transfer very often, thermal conductivity is probably the most common property uh, that is discussed. And so that is the rate of heat flow per unit area 
per unit temperature gradient, okay? So it's in, in that sense, it's like the uh, electrical conductivity. And its relation to the thermal conductance is given here. We have thermal conductance. We'd have to multiply by whatever length our object was uh, and divide by the cross-sectional area through which the heat is flowing. Okay, so this, for those of you who don't work in heat transfer, this is kind of nice to have. One of the things it tells you is that if I really have a nanoscale ballistic object that is producing quanta of thermal conductance, that the thermal conductivity is length dependent. So it would depend on L because G, the conductance, would not depend on the inverse of L, at least if it were ballistic. And therefore, uh, this wouldn't be a very useful property because it would be length dependent. Yes, sir. So I'll just mention, you know, in my lecture I talked about the ballistic mobility. This is the same thing. Yeah. That's created by the confinement. Right. Yep. Yep. And these measurements were done at um, less than one Kelvin, I think. Maybe five Kelvin. So to, to, to see these, to see a quantum or to see a few quanta of thermal conductance, you have to be down at uh, very, very low temperatures. So, again, this is another slide that that kind of um, that kind of says that in a in a different way. But th there's one one thing that's important to note is that that's the maximum that that each channel each allow each channel of heat conduction. In our case, a branch, a phonon branch, can only provide so much energy transport, right? And even if there's nothing blocking it, there's only so many states that are, uh, that are there for, for conduction. Now, if I wanted to take this a step further, and I want to connect this to some of the things that you've done with um, uh, Suprio. So, so kind of the last part of my lecture is really intended to connect you back to some of the electronic transport principles and some of the things that Professor Vidaraja uh, talked about. So we go back to this uh, uh, this general, a more general expression for conductance, um, and we've gone we've gone ahead here and expanded out a few of the terms. But you've seen things very similar to this already. What we've done, and this is uh, this is a dimensionally um, general f expression of conductance because I have this um, dimensionality d shown here. So when I had one dimension, that that term k was not there. But now I'm going to add a transmission function that's akin to the boundary transmittance that we just talked about. There's a, there's a couple of subtle differences, but uh, you could you can imagine that that's uh, th that it, it represents that term. And now what I'd want to do is to understand how now that I know that if I have perfect transmission, I would get some quanta of thermal conductance depending on how many how many channels I had open, how many sums I had um, in that summation. But um, we would start now, now if we, if we say, well, I'm going to scatter something, we would expect this transmission function to decrease as the length of the device gets longer. It'd be harder for something that starts at one end to make it all the way out the other side, right? Um, and we would expect it to decrease also with, with smaller and smaller scattering lengths. So the more scattering I have, meaning the smaller scattering length I have, the, the less likely it is that something gets out the other side. So our rudimentary model says that this transmission function, because I think linearly, right, it would be proportional to the, this, um, this scattering length lambda and inversely proportional to the length of my device L. Remember that I had that, that device before, that green part. Um, there's a problem, though, because and I think this was probably already covered in, in one of Suprio's lectures. As L goes to zero, that rudimentary model would say that, that the transmission goes to infinity because the denominator uh, it has only L in it. So we would correct that to have, um, to, to a form that looks like this where it's the scattering length divided by the sum of the scattering length and the length of the device. This has been done before for the electronic. Uh, again, Suprio does it, uh, it, describes it in his book, and it satisfies what we would like to see. As the length goes to zero, the transmission function goes to one so that we would get back, if we had no scattering, a quantum of thermal conductance, right? So that, it satisfies that part. And then 
as, as L gets very large, then this transmission function is just lambda over L, right? This other term in the denominator, the scattering length in the, in the denominator is um, negligible relative to L. So thermal conductivity, we talked about it a second ago. If we did some kin simple kinetic theory for thermal conductivity, we would find that it is proportional to the product of specific heat. We talked a little bit about that before. Whatever kind of carrier we have. Uh, the product of specific heat, the velocity of the carriers, and the scattering length. So that kind of mean free path. Right? So those three things take the product. There's a one-third factor for three-dimensional problems at least, uh, and you'd get a thermal conductivity. If we go ahead and, and, and uh, plug in, this is, would be for a long diffusive kind of problem, our um, transmission function xi into the, uh, the Landauer form that we had before. You can actually see these terms start to emerge. This, um, this sum over, of, of integrals here is actually expressive of the specific heat. We've pulled out the lambda over L, that's the transmission function term, so we've, we've taken some liberty here to, to assume that that does not depend on wave vector or frequency. Of course it really does in practice, but we're, we're engineers, so a lot of times we will ignore the obvious uh, and in order to, to get something good instead of something perfect. Get something good in a short amount of time instead of something perfect in a, an infinite amount of time, maybe, is the way to put it, right? So we pulled that out. Um, we still have the group velocity. In both cases, we have the group velocity. And then we just have a geometric factor, the length of the device divided by the cross-sectional area. And guess what? We get a thermal conductivity. Again, this the key here is that this integral over K space is simply the, the what this really is going kind of back a, a step or deeper into this that I, I haven't showed. This is really the... Uh, the energy of the internal energy that's stored by all of the different vibrational or electronic states, depending on what kind of carriers we're talking about here, that energy differentiated with respect to temperature, that gives you specific heat, um, and that's all this is. So now we have thermal conductivity is equal to specific heat, group velocity, and this is the key here, we have that mean free path. Again, it's the same as what you would derive from kinetic theory. And the length of our device canceled out with this, uh, with this scaling through the definition of thermal conductivity. So again, this Landauer formalism or, or formulation can be shown to easily match the, uh, that of kinetic theory. And that A, I had misspoke before, it's not area, it's a, it's a constant that depends on the dimensionality of the problem. In 3D, it would be 3. So just to give you a flavor of the real world, I'm doing pretty well on time because I think I'm, I'm going to want about um, five or ten minutes more. Um, <clears throat> carbon nanotubes, you probably know that carbon nanotubes are fantastic electrical conductors. You may or may not know that they're also really, really good thermal conductors, about as good as any solid material. Um, and the reasons are different, at least in, in one sense, the phonons dominate the transport of uh, heat in carbon nanotubes, even in metallic carbon nanotubes. It gets back to one of the questions earlier about electrons. So uh, there, the electron density <coughs> in carbon nanotubes, even metallic ones, is not high enough to, um, to have, at the, near the Fermi level at least, uh, to have uh, a significant uh, contribution to thermal conduction. But phonons... Um, are still, they still dominate. The group velocity of phonons, if, if we compare it to silicon, the group velocity is <clears throat> 10,000 meters per second, which is, you know, respectable and higher by roughly a factor of two than the group velocity for phonons in silicon. This would be near the center of the Brillouin zone, the acoustic phonons. Um, but the, uh, the mean free path is the big difference. So the phonon mean free path is uh, around a micron for, for carbon nanotubes at room temperature, whereas for silicon, the phonon mean free path is only 50 nanometers. So that's where the carbon nanotubes got to have their, their biggest advantage is that the phonons don't scatter very much. And why is that? There's a few different ways of explaining it. Um, 
For one thing, the selection rules for phonon scattering, for phonon phonon scattering in carbon nanotubes are much more restrictive than they are for um, than they are in a three-dimensional bulk material. And so the, the possibilities of having two phonons collide that would produce another phonon that would impede heat flow um, are, are uh, more challenging for that um, kind of that uh, cylindrical nanoscale structure. So, Question. yeah. Uh, what structure of silicon are you using? Are you talking about like diamond? Yeah, yes, yeah, crystalline, single crystal right, silicon. So not like another nanotube? Not, definitely not, no, not a silicon nanotube, which I think I've heard of such things, but um, they've, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely bulk silicon. All right, so here's a, a slide. I think this is in your, your notes, and, and you can hopefully play around with this. There's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, we have a, uh, a atomic chain simulator on the NanoHub uh, where you can define atoms and spring constants in uh, contacts and in a device and you can choose the number of atoms that you have in your device. You can choose the atomic mass. You can choose the spring constants. Uh, here we're showing actually, so this would be kind of like the problem we talked about, the, the two ropes with different mass densities, except now I just have a, a sliver of rope between two contacts. But you can go into this tool and do whatever you want. In fact, you could go in and, and look at the, you could solve an acoustic mismatch problem in, um, yeah, with a with a discrete mass system, which we didn't do today, we just used the we just did the acoustic mismatch for continuum systems. But what we find here is that we get, <clears throat> if we look at transmission, the top curve, it's all everything's identical. There are no interfaces, and so the transmission function goes all the way up. It's a, it takes on a value of one until you reach the the frequency at which the the lattice can no longer. Uh, accommodate phonons, so there, that's that maximum frequency that we talked about, um, the top of the sine wave. And so that's easy and obvious. But then if I have two interfaces, then we will get some scattering, we'll get some transmission, not only at this first interface, but then there'll be some back reflection, uh, there could be some annihilation of waves, there could be some superposition that enhances certain waves, and that's in, indeed what we see. These are Fabry Perot types of peaks. This is for different cases of these uh, of this heterogeneous uh, problem where the device is different than the contacts. So I encourage you to go in and play around with this tool. The the, the URL is given there. Uh, question in the back. How do you get perfect transmission between all the frequencies for the first case? It's a good question because that lattice can only handle um, a frequency up to a certain point, and any frequency above that is not even allowed by the system. So what we do... So, 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 so at two, to ten, two, two times ten to the Yeah. Top one. Uh, the, the top one is. That's the, so this, the, the black curve is the homogeneous case. This, these other two curves, I'm sorry, are, are two different heterogeneous cases. One where the where the device atoms are heavy and one where the device atoms are light. That's okay. Thank you for asking. Good. Okay, so this is again, this is a, um, a, uh, a, a screenshot of the tool. And I'll be here tomorrow. And if you want to tinker around with this thing tonight, maybe we can talk about some problems to solve um, that, that you've worked on. Uh, and we have, uh, I think, plenty of time to to do that in the next day or so. I did want to get back to, um, I wanted to get a little, talk a little bit about electrical noise. Good, that's working. Because one of the things that I'm interested in doing these days is to, is to connect, um, to find better ways to measure temperatures of nano things. And so uh, Professor Vidaraja talked about noise yesterday and there's a couple of types of electrical noise that, that one could exploit, and actually it's the combination of the two that one would exploit. So Johnson noise, or, or Nyquist-Johnson noise, is, is um, 
also sometimes called thermal noise. It's very temperature dependent. It depends on, so this is the S is that uh, noise spectral density that Professor Vidaraja talked about yesterday. And it's, it's a beautiful thing because this noise spectral density is proportional to temperature. And so in theory, if you have kind of a clean signal and you know where the noise is coming from, all you have to do is measure the noise and you know the temperature of that thing. Without any calibration, you don't have to go in to, um, you know, to buy fancy equipment. You would just, except for, of course, the noise. That would be fancy equipment. That qualifies, but nothing else. No fancy thermal equipment. Um, and then it depends on the resistance of the device. So that's very nice. And then shot noise is what he talked about mostly yesterday, where this noise spectral density is uh, proportional to the current that's flowing through the device. So I can, if I can get that going here, you have these different shots of electrons that go through a device. And of course, in a real system, if you're, if you're flowing current, you're going to have some combination of these two things uh, going on simultaneously. And so we have to deal with that. And that combination, uh, uh, Raja talked yesterday about what the, that looks like. So it ends up being a cotangent function when you combine these two forms of noise together. And so you get curves like this. These are isothermal curves. So again, that Johnson noise depended on temperature, whereas shot noise did not. And so you get these um, different curves for different temperatures where this the, the null bias condition is the thing that's temperature dependent, but then they all collapse to this uh, 2EI uh, temperature independent shot noise result. But you could imagine how in a real device, if you, and it, it would depend on a number of different factors, what voltage range you would use and so forth, you could actually measure temperature just by knowing, maybe changing the voltage in a, a few different uh, experiments, or in one experiment, changing the voltage a little bit and plotting out a path on these curves, and that would give you a pretty good idea and a kind of a redundant idea of what your temperature was. Uh, so that would be nice. So what we did is we took that and we said, well, the problem with it is that there's this, this nasty little self-heating that's going to happen in nano objects. When you send current through them, their temperature changes, and if their temperature changes, what's showing on this curve, then they're going to move <coughs> off of one of these curves. And so um, we just did uh, just about the simplest possible um, thermal model, uh, linear thermal model, and we used some devices. These have um, single walled carbon nanotubes growing out of porous alumina with top and bottom contacts. Um, and we, we then applied this. This is the noise signal. We needed to get away from the low frequency. This is 1 over F noise that doesn't have any useful temperature uh, information in it. And so we got out, we, we focused our attention here. So this is out in the, in the uh, dozens of kilohertz range. And we applied this model. So that if we had just used an isothermal model, uh, the, the noise spectrum would look like this. But our, if we, if we have a self-heating model, the red curve ensues, and you can see that our data fall right on top of that. So we, we were able to measure uh, thermal resistance. That's the thing we added to that in order to be able to, to go from different temperatures that, to understand how self-heating changed the temperature. So as we changed current, we changed temperature. All right, so I just wanted to let you know that, that all that business about noise that you heard about yesterday actually has a kind of a, a pretty useful purpose, at least in my group. And that's it. I thank you for your time and we'll take questions. Yeah. So uh, I have a question about the thermal quantum conductance. Mm -hmm. Electrical conductance, we have Q zero H times the number uh, number of moles per m. Yeah. But here we have the summation about P. So is that two step related, or how do we really calculate that? So if you yeah, the number P would depend on the um, so they they are they're like they're things similar to bands, I suppose. Um, in, in phonons, and I didn't get, I didn't really talk about them, but there would be in, um, in a nano wire, you would have, or let's say a nanotube, yeah, I'll say a nano wire. You, an atom would have three degrees of freedom. It could go, if, if the wave is moving this way, it could go vibrate this way, that's longitudinally. Uh, 
and then it has two transverse um, oscillations. So it, it, that would be three of its degrees of freedom. And then there are other ones because of nanoscale objects that, that could be, there could be some twisting modes that would come into play also. So there would be the potential for um, a number of those different kinds. Each one of those would be what you call a mode. Yeah. So, that, so you would have to understand, you, basically what would happen is you would, um, you would do a, a model, uh, a lattice dynamics model that would extract those curves, those P's, P stands for polarizations, uh, of, the, of the phonons, and you would count those, and that's how you would know. That's Yeah. But you are talking about a one-dimensional system, right? Where, so is it not like uh, the polarization will be confined in one dimension? In in the measurements that they did, um, they they ended up doing it essentially on sheets, and so they had four. So the four were um, the again the the transverse. So they were they were nano sheets, but not single atom. So they were the two transverse, one longitudinal. And then they had uh, they had a, a a quadratic mode that they talked about. So they had actually four in that case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thermal conductivity of uh, phonons is proportional to length scale, right? And then and yeah, it, it thermal conductivity due to phonons in bulk materials generally will not be because we'd cancel it out like we did at the end there. But if we had a ballistic device, then yes. Yeah, I, I would say uh, if you took metal, if you took metal nanowires, and I haven't done this calculation, but my intuition tells me if I took metal nanowires down to a size at which you started to separate the, the bands, um, you would have too low, the, the electron um, population around the Fermi level, which is what uh, someone else so poignantly said, is what counts for, th for thermal transport. That would become so low that, uh, that phonons would dominate. And then as you increase the cross-section of that wire and you increase the, the uh, electron density of states around the Fermi level, you would eventually get, you, you would certainly cross over to a place where the electronic contribution was bigger. If you started with a metal where the electronic uh, contribution in the bulk is, is more than phonons, which most metals are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have a question about the initial part of your talk. Mm -hmm. you, you were comparing about uh, thermoelectrics and photovoltaics. And mm -hmm. So uh, it's just a general question. Um, there seems to be quite a lot of work in uh, thermal photovoltaics as well. Yeah. So I was just wondering if thermoelectrics in general provide an advantage over thermal photovoltaic devices. Good, good question. So thermophotovoltaics are um, photovoltaics that are tuned generally to infrared wavelengths, and they take a hot thermal source um, that could be a number of things. But for example, it would be I, I know I've seen them. There's interest on. Um, for spacecraft using radioisotopes and things like that, uh, I think, um, but also waste heat generators. So in that in that case, so the question was, is there an advantage to those over um, thermoelectrics where you would just take waste heat? Um, and I, I'm not, I don't, I, I haven't worked enough in the area to respond very well. I would say that in all likelihood, the thermophotovoltaics would offer you know a potentially higher efficiency if one could tune them right um, because they they don't have any inherent losses the only problem is your your temperature source your band gap would have to be such that um, that you it was optimized for whatever temperature the emitting object was was at yeah of course so in semiconductors acoustic phonons are the primary heat um, carriers that's right and they have a wave, like a wavelength that's smaller than that of electrons. No, the, the the wavelength at room temperature is a couple of a couple of nanometers. So, yeah, the 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 wavelength of the electrons is usually smaller than. That.
Yes. We're going to talk about optical phonons. Um, so yeah. I've got two questions. Could you elaborate what you're going to say about optical phonons? The other ones I heard from Professor Data, the optical phonons are different than the other phonons in that their dispersion is, is it constant or something? No. Okay, so could you elaborate? So optical phonons have a, in the, um, in contrast to, Acoustic phonons, I think we've established, will look like this, quarter sine wave, yeah. And so the optical phonons generally are at higher frequencies, well, almost always at higher frequencies. There might be some overlap here in some materials. This would be for bulk materials. Um, and they have low, but not always zero, uh, group velocity. Group velocity is just going to be the slope of this curve. Um, Einstein, Einstein's model is the one that's most often used for um, thermal calculations with optical phonons, and so the Einstein model would be something like this. You would average um, that frequency and you would, and call it constant, and that would be the Einstein frequency. And the reason that they're so relevant for electrons is that the, the cascade of energy flow in an electron scattering process would be, you know, the electron energies are generally going to be up here because these are only, uh, you know, a few millivolts, uh, generally speaking. Uh, no, I mean, not a few, 100 millivolts. But the electrons, of course, can have much higher energy than that. And so the energy cascade goes from electrons to optical phonons, which are what I would say ubiquitous. So they're kind of all over the place. Um, but then there's another process that has to be involved uh, in order to get that heat. So, so this process causes heating of the device, but then the optical phonons really cannot carry much energy uh, because their group velocity is so low. So then they have to scatter with acoustic phonons, and they, those are the ones that carry it away. So some problems for in electronic transport, essentially to have three effective temperatures or quasi-equilibrium temperatures. There's an electron temperature, there's an optical phonon temperature, and there's an acoustic phonon temperature. And the, the problem really gets to how do you best describe the, the interactions, especially in the time domain, between those three things. Okay. One last. So the phone, uh, the phone has the thermal conductive phase uh, is the same for different branch, optical and uh, Yeah, it's, um, is it the same for different branches? I think it would be. It's also the same for electrons. So if you put electron, if you put Fermi Dirac statistics into that and do the electronic quantum of thermal conductance, you'll get the same answer. Um, and so, yes. Now, the reason that optical phonons are not particular, are, are not especially relevant for that is because in order to do the measurements, one generally has to restrict. So you might have something that looks like this. These might be degenerate. And maybe there's something like that if you have a nano wire material, something that's quadratic but you're going to be restricting your experiment to very long wavelengths. The only way to do that is to do very low temperature experiments so that you, your uh, occupation of these optical states is very low, negligible, generally speaking. Now, if you take a nanomaterial, um, like a graphene nano ribbon or something, you're going to actually see a lot of... Um, of uh, optical-like phonons that are that are having low frequency, uh, so that nanomaterials are a bit different. I'd wanted to to go into that a little bit more, but I think the, with the time limitations, uh, maybe for next year or something. There will be a next year. So, yeah. okay, time for a break. All right, very good. Thank you.